Thank you so much for that really kind introduction, um, Tina, and big thank you to uh, Professor Matthew Rima and Professor Mohammed Zahir Abbas um, for the invitation to speak to you. Uh, it's my first visit to QUT and it's such a beautiful campus. Um, I'm really jealous <laughs> of what you have here. And I'm also really excited by the program that's been put together by Matthew and Mohammed and looking forward to some great discussions today. So, um, there we go. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yugara people as the First Nations owners and custodians of the lands and beautiful waterways on which we're meeting today and pay my respects to elders past and present, to emerging leaders and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us today. As Tina's mentioned, um, at the McCabe Centre, our mission is to promote the effective use of law for the prevention and control of cancer and other non-communicable diseases by building knowledge, expertise, networks and capacity at global, regional and domestic levels. There we go. So um, we are also just almost celebrating our 12th birthday, um, our founding director, uh, Jonathan Lieberman um, established us back in 2012. Um, and we since then have developed some really great relationships with a range of institutions. Um, we have enjoyed working with QUT on tobacco control and also with others in your um, center around end of life work. Um, the McCabe Center's work spans both prevention and the treatment and supportive care side for people affected by cancer. And um, like your center here, that encompasses such a broad range of issues. So it gives us a really fantastic opportunity opportunity to work with people um, from a range of disciplines, not only in Australia, but around the world. As Tina mentioned, um, we host the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control Knowledge Hub on Legal Challenges. Um, we're celebrating our 10th birthday for that this very month. We signed our MOU um, 10 years ago. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we've done as a knowledge hub um, in a moment. And we're also the WHO Collaborating Centre on Law and Non-Communicable Disease. Um, and through that work, we work very closely with the WHO Western Pacific Regional Office, um, but also across um, WHO uh, more broadly on initiatives to address non-communicable diseases through law. So in terms of our work as a WHO FCTC Knowledge Hub, um, we were the first knowledge hub to be designated under the treaty and our specific role is to support parties to respond to legal challenges brought by the tobacco industry against measures implementing the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And we do that through a range of different ways, um, through um, developing resources and information on our Knowledge Hub website, which is publicly available um, for parties as well as for, for the general public. Um, we've also run some really intensive training and capacity building programs over that time, um, working with um, a range of different WHO regions. We've done some specific trainings focused on tobacco plain packaging, for example, and very much drawn from Australia's um, efforts in tobacco plain packaging and sharing those lessons um, with countries around the world. We've worked with 100 different parties across all six WHO regions. And, um, and specifically in terms of tobacco plain packaging, we've worked with 19 of the 23 parties that have uh, to date implemented plain packaging. And of course, many more parties are working on, on that as well. And, and we're supporting that as best we can. We've had a specific program of work um, supporting the Pacific um, in implementing tobacco control measures. And we've had three um, Pacific workshops um, over the past three years funded by the Australian government. Um, in the past, much of our training programs happened in person in Melbourne, um, and we've also run some regional workshops um, in various um, parts of the world. More recently, as with um, a lot of things, we've had to transition that to an online program. That's had some benefits um, because it's actually allowed us to reach a lot more people and a lot more parties. Um, and particularly um, because of the lower cost of running an online program, we've been able to offer that to more regions. And we've had quite significant interest, for example, from the Eastern Mediterranean region and also um, from the Pajo region or Latin America um, on some of our work, which in the past we were not funded to deliver or to, to fly them out to Australia due to the costs. So it's been great to actually be able to support those parties through online work. Um, but um, this work is really never done, and I'm sure Matthew would agree on that. And um, 
there's always new challenges and new um, strategies brought forward by the tobacco industry um, to um, put a hold on progress on implementing the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And I think um, although it's a really um, exciting week here in Australia with the introduction of these new um, tobacco control laws just passing Parliament um, this week, um, it's also really important for us to remember the importance of maintaining vigilance and the ongoing um, uh, burden that tobacco causes in Australia and around the world. So just briefly, I've put some statistics up here on the slide. I'm sure many of you are already very familiar with these. Um, but there's still um, around one in 10 Australians um, who are current daily smokers, and that's still causing more than 20,000 deaths um, from smoking a year. Um, and it's costing our society billions and billions of dollars to deal with the effects of tobacco. And certainly that's also felt disproportionately by certain groups um, in lower socioeconomic areas in Australia. And of course, we also see that globally when we're thinking about the importance of regulating tobacco. There's 1.3 billion tobacco users worldwide, but we are seeing um, more and more smokers in low and middle income countries as tobacco industry is sort of adapting their strategies to address countries where perhaps regulation is not as strict as it now is in some of the high income countries. It's still a leading cause of preventable death with 8 million deaths per year. And there's, as I said, been a significant rise in the percentage of smokers in low and middle income countries since the 1970s. And on top of the health impacts, um, we're also seeing more and more attention to the social and environmental impacts of tobacco, both in terms of farming and plastics, and even some of the minerals that are used in e-cigarettes um, and, and the risks that they pose. And overall, the over, uh, major development challenge posed by tobacco um, with global social costs estimated at 1.4 trillion US dollars per year. So it's just an incredible um, cost on our society. But we also know that um, regulation to address tobacco um, can have really significant impacts. And on this slide, it might be a little bit small, um, but we can see tracking the overall trend in um, the reduction in daily smokers in Australia tracked against some of the key legislative um, changes that have come through over time. This chart just uh, uh, covers from 1990 to 2018. Um, so we don't have the new laws on here yet, but we can see at some of those milestone points, just that consistent trend downwards. And we're hoping that that will just keep coming down. I mean, we've already seen, I think there was about a 20% um, daily smoking rate, even in 2005, which isn't that long ago, and it's already come down to about 10%. But we do need to see more action um, to keep reducing that and to get down to our 5% target. So just to recap on the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, I'm sure some many people in the room are very familiar with this as the first international treaty negotiated under the auspices of the WHO. Um, and that's celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Um, it entered into force in 2005, but drafted in uh, 2003. And currently it covers 90% of the world's population, which is just a really significant and impressive number. Um, with 183 parties and new parties are continuing to join. Um, Malawi just joined in um, August this year. And the measures in the treaty emphasize an approach to minimize both tobacco, tobacco demand and supply through a range of measures, um, including protecting public health policies from industry interference, price and tax measures, regulating the packaging and labeling of tobacco products, banning tobacco advertising, promotion and sponsorship amongst other things. And um, it's supported by a range of institutions um, in terms of the WHO um, FCTC Convention Secretariat um, based in Geneva that we work through quite, quite closely, although a surprisingly small team once you um, peer behind the curtain. And they coordinate with other WHO um, efforts and, and UN agencies that have a tobacco remit as well. Um, the FCTC Conference of the Parties is the governing body for the treaty. Um, and also there are now nine knowledge hubs around the world supporting um, implementation of the treaty. Um, they are based in a real range of countries and have a range of, of um, quite specific remits. So for example, there's the Tobacco Taxation Knowledge Hub based in South Africa. Um, we have the Smokeless Tobacco um, Knowledge Hub based in India. We have one focusing just the newest one on tobacco um, marketing and promotion um, measures to, you know, uh, 
reduce that um, based in France, supported by the French Ministry of Health and one on surveillance in Finland, just to name a few. So there's a, there's a broad um, a variety of resources that are available to parties um, and potentially there may even be more um, with a recommendation for a knowledge hub focusing on um, e-cigarettes as part of the current um, COP um, uh, matters to be discussed. And I, I think it's really important to note how much progress and um, uh, that the WHO FCTC and other tobacco control measures have achieved over time. It does set out really e uh, sensible evidence-based measures that are able to be implemented in countries of all income levels. And uh, I thought it was interesting to note that just this week, um, although the US is not a party to the FCTC, um, relevantly, BAT admitted that its US cigarette brands will be worthless within decades um, and have set a 30-year lifetime on some of the US brands' value, and they've taken um, over a $31 billion non-cash impairment. So that's the first time a tobacco company has actually publicly um, acknowledged that there's no future in those conventional tobacco products, but of course they are putting significant efforts in all of the um, newer products to try and make sure that they maintain their market. Um, so the FCTC does provide this really flexible framework um, and examples of best practice implementation, but um, there are challenges in terms of um, countries implementing what's set out in the FCTC. And this chart is drawn from the most recent um, WHO Global Progress Report on tobacco, which was just released, intended to be released for the COP, um, but now uh, that's been delayed a little bit. But um, in this global progress report, we can see that 55 of the 182 parties at the time the study was put together um, were on track for a 30% relative reduction in tobacco use prevalence for ages 15 plus. Um, so that's that's not a majority. 88% um, 88, uh, 88 out of 182 have decreasing figures, um, but they're not on track for that 30% relative reduction. So 14 of the parties, there's no decrease at all, and 25, they haven't provided enough data. Um, so that's just one example of um, some of the gaps in implementation um, or the impact of that. And the gaps reported most frequently um, have been around gaps in financial resources to address the WHO FCT, to implement the WHO FCTC, a lack of human resources and capacity, and the need for more training and capacity building. Um, and the implementation barriers that have been discussed have been significantly the tobacco industry interference, which always comes up as the number one, number one barrier. And um, many parties to the FCTC still don't have the basic um, demand reduction measures in place. And um, in a 2017 study, only one country was found to have implemented all five of those key demand reduction measures. And the average uh, level of implementation for all 126 countries which were part of that study um, was just over one out of five. So there's still a lot of work to be done um, on FCTC implementation. And even in Australia, although we've had a really strong history of tobacco control and we've seen that great um, that track uh, trend of reduced consumption, um, and we've had the history of being the first country to implement um, plain packaging and one of the first on graphic health warnings, We've also, um, obviously I've uh, a little bit biased, but we've had some fantastic anti-smoking campaigns um, organized by Cancer Council and, and many other organizations and governments. Um, and we've provided strong support for other countries. Um, it, it did become evident, um, particularly over the past 10 years, that there were some real gaps in Australia's tobacco control laws. Um, and so this slide is referencing the um, laws in place pr prior to the ones that have just been introduced. So some of the gaps in terms of responding to the FCTC in Australia um, that we were aware of and advocating to government about over this time have been just responding to the, the plethora of new products on the market, which are continuing um, to, to come forward each day, particularly around crush ball, crush ball capsule, capsules, which are a little um, a ball inside the filter that you can crush and then get the sort of menthol heat for the smoker, um, different filters, um, I think a really significant gap was that we had no way to respond to social media and the new marketing techniques associated with social media and particularly around e-cigarette advertising. Um, I think our tobacco control laws were uh, very confusing with uh, a lot of inconsistencies in state and territory legislation um, on a range of topics. Um, there's also been an ongoing gap. We don't have laws implementing Article 5.3 of the um, WHO FCTC. 
TC, which is the one relating to tobacco industry interference. We do have, um, I think it was in 2019, there was a policy for public Australian public officials um, that was released and developed and disseminated by the Department of Health. Um, but it did still have some gaps that we still see. Um, for example, there's no um, restriction in relation to political donations from tobacco companies are being made to politicians. So uh, the National Party, for example, still receives um, donations from the tobacco industry and ongoing issues with high rates of smoking in priority populations and also a real lack of investment in mass media campaigns over the past 10 years. So um, the reforms that are now coming through in Australia are really fantastic to see and have been a result of such great um, advocacy and, and as Tina mentioned, you know, translating the evidence um, of public health measures into practice um, through working with government and policymakers um, for so many years. So we've seen that um, there's been announced um, uh, laws to update and modernise plain packaging and tobacco advertising prohibitions, um, including regulations to close loopholes, including by extending advertising prohibitions to e-cigarettes. So that's really fantastic to see. Um, there's also a consolidation of federal tobacco control legislation, um, also including consumer law provisions for graphic health warnings on tobacco uh, packaging and bans on oral tobacco. Um, introducing new contents and disclosure requirements, including a national level ban on flavoured tobacco products and requirements to report certain information to regulators and an increase in excise on tobacco products and adjustments to calculation of the roll your own excise. Um, there's also a range of reforms for nicotine vaping products and I'm, I'm sure Matthew will go through this as well, um, including and some of these will be coming in sooner, some of them will be coming in a bit later, but um, restrictions on importation, supply and manufacture of non-therapeutic e-cigarettes, both nicotine and non-nicotine, including a ban on importation of disposable e-cigarettes from the 1st of January. Um, introduction of product standards, including for packaging and ingredients and notification requirements on unapproved products that are prescribed for therapeutic use. And uh, it, the new um, announcements ensure that existing laws that only permit nicotine products to be supplied for therapeutic use or with a prescription can be enforced. And that's been a real gap um, uh, under the current laws, which, which came in uh, a couple of years back. Um, there's been real issues with actually enforcing um, on e-cigarettes because there's um, often um, e-cigarettes that um, are not necessarily state on the packet that they contain nicotine, but they may well do that. And it's very hard for um, the enforcement agencies to know whether they fall within the scope of the existing laws or not. So they're really trying to tighten that up so that it will be much easier for products that are most likely um, contravening um, the act to be, um, to be uh, confiscated. Um, and there's also some other measures that have been flagged in Australia's na national tobacco strategy. And uh, the good thing about the most recent national tobacco strategy when it was released is that it's really much more closely aligned with the FCTC and, and references that. Um, and some of those are shown here on the slide. Um, and um, we're, yeah, we're really uh, pleased to see that and, and hoping to see more um, of these implemented and also funded in terms of the wraparound measures. Uh, I, I had this slide up earlier that showed, you know, the introduction of Australian laws and then the, the decrease in consumption, but I really should recognise that, um, and what we always say in our training is that law can only go so far and that they need to be supported by public education campaigns, cessation support, you know, um, education for GPs um, on pathways. So it's not just introducing the law that's going to create that change, but making sure that the whole package of measures is there to transition people away from smoking and, and allow them to have the support that they need, and also to ensure that people understand why the laws have been introduced. So that's something that comes up a lot in the trainings um, and, and programs that we do. And I uh, just briefly wanted to touch on some of the overseas developments that we've seen. Um, it, it's been a real state of flux um, in terms of tobacco um, over the past year. Last year I was at the um, World Cancer Congress on a panel with, um, the, at the time, the Assistant Health Minister for New Zealand, Aisha Verrill, um, and everyone was congratulating her on the introduction of the um, smoke-free generation laws in New Zealand. I think she got a standing ovation from, you know, all of the cancer delegates around the world. And now um, New Zealand had announced that they were going to um, restrict sales of cigarettes to people. Um, I think it was born after 2009. 
Um, and now there's moves from the new government that's come in um, to roll that back. Um, and one of the things that's been meant, reported in the media as to why that they wanted to roll that back was because they wanted to access more of the tobacco taxation um, that would be available, which to me just seems like such a perverse argument um, as a reason to um, remove a, a public health supportive law. Um, but unfortunately, we have also seen um, in some other countries that had made some bold announcements about how they were going to create a smoke-free, uh, tobacco-free generation. Um, both Malaysia and Denmark had also made announcements around um, restricting sales to people um, born after a certain time. Um, unfortunately, the aspects of the uh, Malaysia's most recent tobacco control law that's just gone through, I think, in the past month, they removed the generational ban um, elements from that law because they were having such difficulty in getting it passed. So potentially that's still something they'll be able to introduce in the future. And I know that tobacco control advocates um, are very actively working on that. And at the same conference I was at last year, there was um, the head of the Malaysian Cancer Society there who was talking about um, the, um, the uh, fun and games behind the scenes on some of those laws. So. Perhaps that, that will come back, but for now, that aspect of the law hasn't been introduced. And similarly in Denmark, um, there was a move to have restrictions on sales past a certain age, but as I understand it, um, they've now said there's a concern that that law might be in conflict with European Tobacco Product Directive, um, and so they're not pursuing that aspect of the law. Um, despite that, as many of you will have seen, Rishi Sunak in the UK did announce a smoke regeneration intention as well. So we'll see if the UK goes forward with that, um, uh, given, given what's happening globally. I think it's interesting that the Malaysian, um, one of the arguments around the Malaysian bill and why they've taken out the generational measures was a constitutional one around concerns that it would, um, having that age ban would not provide equal treatment under the law, under their constitution. Um, so yeah, interesting to see the arguments that are being raised. But we have seen some other really interesting developments overseas. I'll just briefly mention um, in India, for example, um, they've just introduced laws, I think in the past few months, um, as the first country to regulate tobacco um, health warnings on streaming platforms, which I think is a really forward looking measure. So they'll have warnings at the start and the end of programs where there's tobacco smoking, because that's been a real gap. And obviously we're all watching Netflix these days. So we, we need to um, be accessing the forms of media that we're access, uh, that where people are. And in some countries, um, they've also introduced different product regulation measures, um, include, including reducing nicotine levels and ingredient bans. Um, and we're seeing that now being introduced in Australia as well in terms of the ingredient bans. And the reducing nicotine levels was also a really key element of the, of the New Zealand laws. So um, initially when I agreed to do this presentation, I was planning to do a big recap of the Conference of the Parties, which was supposed to have happened from the 20th to the 25th of November this year. Um, but we're all being agile and flexible and adjusting. The Conference of the Parties was uh, postponed because there was major civil unrest um, in Panama about this um, new mining um, proposal. Um, so the, the whole conference was canceled, well, postponed a week before we were supposed to fly out. Luckily, it has been rescheduled to February, um, which is important because it's the first, will be the first in-person meeting of the parties um, in six years. And um, we did have a virtual COP in 2021, but a lot of the contentious measures were not discussed in any detail as part of that virtual COP um, because it, I think there was just a fear that it would be too difficult um, to, um, to reach a consensus, particularly around e-cigarettes and some of those more contentious measures. So there are some really um, important things that will be discussed as part of the COP that we'll be following with interest. Um, we will be attending as a Knowledge Hub, but we only have a, um, just an um, observation role as part of the COP. And um, so there's a few agenda items on Articles 9 and 10, which relate to contents and disclosure, um, covering both tobacco and e-cigarettes, as well as emerging products such as nicotine pouches. Um, there's uh, some discussion around forward-looking tobacco control measures. Um, I think there's a real concern to make sure that um, parties are encouraged to adopt measures that are not necessarily explicitly outlined in the COP, but still in line with, uh, sorry, out, they're not outlined in the FCTC, but um, are in line with the FCTC's goals. Um, and there's um, just a bit of concern to make sure that 
we're not framing those as going beyond the treaty um, because we want to make sure that as far as possible it's sort of within the bounds of what the treaty is already encouraging parties to do. Um, there's some um, a decision around um, tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship in entertainment media and parties will be asked to um, adopt specific guidelines there. There'll be an interesting discussion on liability um, under Article 19 of the COP. Um, this um, article is specifically around seeking, um, you know, encouraging countries to run cases against the tobacco industry and to recover costs for um, that, that have been incurred by, for example, the public health system. And there have been a few cases. One of our alumni in Brazil is uh, was working on a, is working on a case there um, that the Brazilian government has launched against the tobacco industry. Um, I think it's um, quite difficult to run those cases. Um, the tobacco industry obviously um, fights at every stage. And um, I think from our perspective, we're often considered to be the knowledge hub on liability, whereas actually we're, we're more focused on defending um, the tobacco control measures that have been put in place. Um, so from our perspective, there's a really great toolkit of information on liability that's available for parties who do want to um, take that route. But um, the clear message that's come through from the Global Progress Report is that generally there's a need for more investment in capacity um, and capacity building across the board. And so investing in that legal capacity across the board is what we'd like to see rather than um, focusing um, too much attention only on Article 19, but looking at that in the broader sense. Um, and there's also been dis discussions around the implementation review and support mechanism um, for the FCTC, which uh, has ended up being quite different to some of the um, mechanisms that you see under other treaties. And just very briefly, we are expecting the tobacco industry to um, launch attempts to interfere with all of these measures. Um, they're very good at doing that. Um, these are some images, I think it's from COP8 in India. They sponsored all of these billboards that um, pa uh, parties would be seeing on their travel between the hotel and the conference venue um, with different messages saying, you know, don't destroy my livelihood, um, save me from vested interests. Um, they've also done things like hosted um, different vaping events and other lobbying events in the hotels, in the hotel lobbies where um, parties are staying. So they can't escape seeing them. The um, tobacco industry is excluded from attending um, the COP, um, which is um, interesting when you think about, you know, the um, uh, uh, climate change COP and, and how many difficulties there are with um, vested interests there. But um, the party, uh, the tobacco industry still finds other ways to interfere. And I think this goes to just that point that came up earlier around tobacco industry interference being a, a number one barrier. Um, I think the informal feedback we've heard about this upcoming COP is that there are, there's a little bit of concern because some of the parties that are attending might be sending 20 delegates this time when in the past they might have only sent one or two and they're very low income countries. So there's a bit of a question mark as to who's funding for their 20 delegates to get there. Um, they are, parties are of course meant to comply with Article 5.3 and, and set out their declaration of interest form. Um, but yeah, there's there's some clear evidence that there's a weight of numbers that you wouldn't expect from certain parties. So we're watching that with, with a bit of concern. So um, just to sort of wrap up, um, there's really an ongoing need for implementation assistance for the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, given that many of the main uh, parties don't have the basic demand reduction measures in place. Um, we really need to focus on accelerating implementation. Um, I think it's really significant to note how far um, the funding gap for tobacco control, how far that lags behind. I mean, more broadly, non-communicable diseases are um, very underfunded um, in the global health context. Perhaps this comes down to not having that element of crisis that you might see on, in some other areas of, of global health. But the global funding gap for tobacco control has been estimated at um, 427 billion US dollars. Um, and that's no signs of um, decreasing. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has put that under even further stress. So that financing for tobacco control really lags behind other global health measures. And it remains really important for countries like Australia um, and other countries to cooperate to support other parties to put in place the basics of the FCTC. So moving forward, um, 
I'm really um, pleased to see um, the developments from the past week um, on Australian tobacco control law uh, and all colleagues across the public health sector are no doubt celebrating. And we have to celebrate these victories because it's a really long road to get there. Um, but it's also important to keep your eye on the ball and to keep progressing and supporting other parties. We can all do better in implementing the FCTC and ultimately in saving lives. So we want to keep um, ensuring cooperation between all parties to support these measures. And um, my centre, obviously, um, we do a range of work around tobacco control and other um, issues relating to law and cancer and other NCDs. Um, we'd really welcome um, collaboration and discussions with anybody in the room that's also got an interest in this area so that we can work together to keep uh, supporting parties to um, reduce the global burden of tobacco control. So that's where I'll leave it for now, but thank you once again for the invitation and I'm really interested to hear from Matthew and the rest of the speakers.